Now hear the reading of the word from Zechariah, chapter 14, 1 through 21. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the women raped. Half of the city shall go into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountain shall reach to Azal. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. On that day there shall be no light, cold, or frost. and There shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. On that day living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea, It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. The whole land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Rimmon south of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the former or to the place of the former gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the king's winepress. And it shall be inhabited, for there shall never again be a decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. And on that day a great panic from the Lord shall fall on them, so that each will seize the hand of another, and the hand of one will be raised against the hand of the other. Even Judah will fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be collected, gold, silver, and garments in great abundance. And a plague like this plague shall fall on the horses, the mules, the camels, the donkeys, and whatever beasts may be in those camps. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come up against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain. There shall be the plague with which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. This shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Booths. And on that day there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, Holy to the Lord. And the pots in the house of the Lord shall be as the bowls before the altar. And every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. And there shall be no longer any traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, you may recall that we spent a number of Sundays looking at Zechariah last spring and last summer as a parallel to our study in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. In that study, we learned that the Jews had just returned from captivity. We looked at multiple visions, which included horsemen and flying scrolls and flying baskets, as well as the promise of the king priest, Joshua the priest representing the prophets and Zerubbabel the king representing the law. We also learned that we are called to justice and to mercy. We heard the promise of peace in the midst of judgment. We read of the king of Jerusalem 
entering that city humble and mounted on a donkey. We celebrated the restoration of Judah in that time. And then came the shock of the slaughtered flock. The shepherd struck down. But those who pierced the shepherd cried out for mercy, even as they were scattered and tested and refined by fire. All this points to God's sovereign ordering of even the smallest minutia of life. It also points to his sovereign mercy to prepare a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. There's your summary of 13 chapters of Zechariah. And now we come to chapter 14, and we come to Luther's less than encouraging comment. And he said, here in this chapter, I give up. (laughs) Uh, I think perhaps this is the most difficult passage I have ever preached one week after I was ordained. (laughs) Has anybody else ever experienced buyer's remorse? (laughs) With that less than encouraging introduction, let's pray. (laughs) Father, I do pray that you would open your word, that you would make it a convicting yes, but also sweet to our ears. This day, I pray in Christ's name, amen. Uh, I'll give you my outline very quickly. We'll look at basic interpretations very briefly, and I'll hint at the application of the passage. And then we'll start our exegesis, walking through the passage. There are essentially four sections, and if you want to mark in your bulletin, that's fine. The numbers of the verses are very tiny. They're there, though. Uh, Verses 1 through 2 is the battle won by the nations. Verses 3 through 11 is the Lord then winning the war. Verses 12 through 14, we find the plagues or the way in which the Lord wins the war. Verses 16 through 21, the result of the war and the worship at the Feast of Booths. And then finally, I'll close with application. Um, Basic interpretations. Uh, I will resolutely avoid, if possible, making this sermon about millennial views, but we have to at least acknowledge the conversation. Um, So we're going to look at three basic views And then I'll hopefully give us an approach on how to, at least how to approach apocalyptic literature. First of all, the figurative interpretation. Let's jump right in. Generally speaking, this is associated with those that hold to the post-millennial viewpoint, which says that this prophecy figuratively points to the time of Christ and the destruction of Jerusalem and the dawn of the church age. Accordingly, this chapter then, according to them, speaks of things that have already been fulfilled spiritually. The second interpretation is just the spiritual interpretation. They simply ignore the question of fulfillment altogether and apply the principles found here to the life of the believer or the life of the church. They look for larger principles to expound upon. Number three, the future interpretation. This is often associated with the premillennial view that the destruction described here is actually a worldwide collapse and war before the second coming of Christ. So then most of this would be applied to the future sometime down the road, though there may be application to us in the here and now. However, um, there are others who approach literature like this and attempt to find a balance Some will say it's associated with the optimistic amillennial position. However, rather than being tied to a millennial position, it's really an effort to treat apocalyptic literature in a consistent way. It allows for a literal past fulfillment, or at least some literal past fulfillment. It allows for a spiritual fulfillment and application in the life of the church and the believer, and for a future fuller fulfillment. Um, Along with the early church fathers such as Cyril and the historian Eusebius, Calvin says this, I doubt not that the prophet meant here to include the calamities which were near at hand. He says it was fulfilled 
in the time between Zechariah and Christ with the Maccabean Wars, when the Jews were trying to gain their independence. It seems that Calvin doesn't fit very well with any of our modern traditional (laughs) views of the millennium. In fact, much to my dismay this week, Calvin, Luther, John Gill, Matthew Henry, Matthew Poole, they all disagree as to the fulfillment of this passage. (laughs) Worse yet, pre-mill, post-mill, ah-mill, all look to this passage for a proof text for their position. (laughs) Therefore, it will come as no surprise to you when I say the safest uh, way to approach this chapter is to continue doing what we have been doing in Revelation. We must remember, first of all, that it meant something to the people at hand. Secondly, it points to Christ because Scripture points to Christ. And it may point to specific things. Remember in Zechariah 9, it said the king would come riding on a donkey. And what did the king do? Come riding on a donkey. Finally, number three, If the word of God is the living word, if Jerusalem is the Old Testament picture of the New Testament church, then it applies to us in the here and now. Therefore, Calvin, Luther, Gill, Henry, Poole, they all offer us some wisdom, even if we don't subscribe to a specific millennial view. Biblical prophecy often has a near and far application. Apocalyptic literature not only foretells, it instructs, it prepares, it provides warning and hope to its audience. Therefore, here's the takeaway from all that. This passage is intensely practical. It's a picture of past events. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. And it's a picture of the church and a pattern for real life, including the battle that we wage within our own minds. This chapter, here's my summary. This chapter is a call to run the longest lap, to fight the good fight, to proclaim the good news, to evangelize the world with confidence, and even to look for and expect the return of those that are now railing against Christ and His church. To rest in security and hope because God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life that includes... Persecution, flying bullets, hatred, destruction, plagues, violation, marriage troubles, sorrow, and loss. That may not be all that encouraging. Neither was Luther. But we will find that the Lord of hosts is. My children love to run cross-country. I don't know why, but they do. And uh, when I'm speaking with Jonathan... Uh, we start talking about how the, sort of the pace of the race. And, uh, you know, when they're at these cross-country meets, there's maybe 50 or 100 guys or gals lined up on, at the starting line, and you can tell they've got all this energy. They're just raring to go, and they're, they first jostle for their place in this, the midst of this crowd that's running down the, the, the greenway. And that first mile is filled with that, that initial energy, that, that anticipation for the rest of the race. Will I get out in front? Can I run my best time yet? Can I beat myself in the last race? That's the beginning of the journey. If we could, just for the moment, look at that metaphorically at the Christian's life. We come to know the gospel and we're raring to go. And then comes the second mile when the muscles start to seize and you wonder if you can make it to the third mile. You wonder if you started too fast. You started second-guessing yourself. Did we start too slow? The second mile is hard. Before that third mile comes and the endorphins finally kick in and you drop your pace and you drop your time and you run across the finish line. That second mile is tough. Here's my charge today before we jump into the text. When you hit that second mile, that longest lap, Endure, for you are secure in the palm of God Almighty. Endure, for you are secure in the palm of God Almighty. Look to verse 1. 1 and 2. We read that the day is coming when the spoil will be divided in the midst of Jerusalem 
He will gather nations to battle. Terrible things shall happen. Half the city is dragged away. Do you recall what we read in Zechariah chapter 1? We read this, As the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so He has dealt with us. The exiles were not allowed to trust in their strength, their city, or to expect just victory just because they were the chosen people of God. Likewise, we don't trust in our strength. We don't trust in the doctrine of election, even if it is sweet to our ears. Rather, we trust in sola Christus, Christ alone. Keep in mind, this whole prophecy was delivered to a a defeated people. And now they were hearing another prophecy of coming defeat. How much can one take? It's often said that the Lord will not give you more than you can handle, right? Hogwash. (laughs) The Lord always gives you more than you can handle. Jesus said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Lord always gives you more than you can handle. John Calvin did write, it is certain that he will not in chastening us exceed what is just. But what is just is always more than we can handle, is it not? Now he does promise not to tempt you beyond your ability for that is based on the faith and grace that he gives you. But here we see that he promises more than they can handle. The city is overrun. The houses are plundered. The women are ravaged. Is this more than you could handle? I dare say it is. I dare say that you would crumple into a puddle of tears and anguish were that to actually happen. It's more than we can handle. Do not, in your Bluetooth-enabled chair, boast about how you would stand firm in the face of your family being torn limb from limb. You will lose it. You will lose it when loved ones are lost or when the day is overwhelming and you can't parent one minute more or when the loneliness causes dark fog, the dark fog of purposelessness to creep up from the ground like a flood in which you begin choking and sputtering for life. Is this meaningless? Did you know that that Nietzsche agreed with the preacher of Ecclesiastes? Everything is meaningless and vanity. However, his premise was wrong. His premise was that God doesn't exist. The preacher eventually affirms that all is meaningful because there is a just God that does exist, and therefore pain is filled with purpose. Evil in the world is meaningless unless there is a good and powerful God. Now, I didn't say it would be filled with uh, a sentimental happiness, just that it had purpose. You will be refined. You will be purified. Is that not how chapter 13 ends? Look back just a minute for chapter 13 Verse 9, and I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines uh, silver and test them as one and test them as gold is tested. Now, Philip Schaff says this As war brings out the heroic qualities of men, so did the persecution develop the patience, the gentleness, the endurance of Christians, and, and prove the world conquering power of faith. You see, nations rage. People's plot in vain, and they say, let us burst their bonds apart. They are waging a war, and often, do you know, they win the battle. They win. And here, they're so confident in verse 1 that they divide the spoil in the midst of the city of peace. Now, as an aside, I was reading one commentary, and uh, Joyce Baldwin noted that at this stage in history, they would not have had much. They just returned from exile, and yes, some of the the vessels were sent back, but there wasn't much left. They came back to rubble and ruin. And she says this, The only explanation is that this is an ideological conflict to remove a non-cooperative element, that would be the Jews, that blocked the way to an international 
world order. Now, don't jump to conclusions. We're not talking about the League of Nations or the UN. But we do know, we do know that there will always be intolerance to the truth, usually in the name of tolerance. This is an ideological battle. The Jews had the same issues. They were non-cooperative, fully uh, uh, adherent and committed to their scriptures. The church is non-cooperative. We are fully committed to the word, Christ Jesus. Did not Jesus say, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven? For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This literature, this chapter should prepare us for many battles, some of which we will lose, some of which will look like the church being rent asunder. In Revelation chapter 11, we learn that the beast will arise and kill two witnesses. Sodom and Egypt will appear to have won. In Revelation 11.10, the wicked rejoice and exchange presents in the midst, for they think the witnesses... The law and the prophets are dead and gone. Here in Zechariah, the nations divide the spoil. They divide what's left. They divide our marriages. They divide our children. They divide all we have left. Revelation 13, we learned that the the first beast was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. It tells of widespread apostasy. Folks taken captive. Some are slain by the sword. And then we have this little sentence in Revelation chapter 13, verse 10. Sort of uh, comes out of the blue in some ways. Here is a call for the endurance of the faith of the saints. How much can we handle? But then comes verse 3. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. The Lord comes to fight. He gives the two witnesses breath once again. This is true for Zechariah's day, John's day, Luther's day, and our day. The point is that Jesus comes to fight. See there in verses 4 and 5, His feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. In verse 5, people flee to the valley that's created by the earthquake. This fleeing from this earthquake is not intended really to strike fear in their hearts. This is actually a mercy, but rather to point to a sudden and unexpected rescue and escape from all the destruction. It's fascinating. The mount splits and makes a valley of protection. Just move on with me here for a moment. Zechariah 7, or I'm sorry, 14.7 says, There shall be a unique day. At evening time there will be light. Now, George will be uh, looking at the city that does not need the sun or the moon uh, pretty soon. But here, metaphorically speaking, just when life comes crashing, just when relationships break, when your sin proves that your heart is deceitful above all things, when Jesus is hanging breathless on the cross, then comes resurrection. You see, only the dead can rise. Then flows the river of life. In verses 8 and 9, the river shall continue in summer, in winter. And as we learned in Ezekiel 47, there's going to be awesome fly fishing at that river. (laughs) There will always be hope in the victory of Christ over death. There shall never again be the decree of utter destruction. The Lord will finish His work that He has begun. He will work in you to will and to do. Is that not good news for us now? Was it not good news for Zechariah as well? Will it not be good news for the church in years to come? In verses 10 and 11, as we make our way through this glorious chapter, we find that Everything else is flattened except for Jerusalem. Made into a plain, only the city of peace will be secure. 
Does that remind you of anything? Maybe uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 4. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places plain. Uh, You see, organizations like the Freedom From uh, Religion Foundation may win battles in the effort to eradicate faith and freedom. But the Lord raises up folks like Coach Sweeney at Clemson and they stop the tide. That, that was my uh, best effort at a joke at how to do bad eschatology. <laughs> we needed a little bit of comic relief because now we have to enter the plagues. This is a heavy chapter. There's so much destruction. Chapter presents us essentially with two acts, 1 through 11 and 12 through the end of the chapter, two cycles We've gotten used to these cycles in Revelation, and they give us a new perspective as they come around. In verses 12 through 15, we have this, these terrible scenes of judgment. Look there. Their flesh will rot, in verse 12, while standing on their feet. You see, their purposes will be thwarted. Their eyes will rot in their sockets. This is, this is, uh, this is the making of a good movie. What they covet will become a millstone around their neck. Their tongues will rot in their mouths. What was fun and what used to satisfy will become distasteful and ugly to them. The second part of the plague, the second part of the Lord's defense, you find in verse 13, great panic. You see, evil will implode upon itself. Remember Proverbs 26 and verse 27, we have this. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it, and a stone will come back on him who starts it rolling. Evil will implode upon itself. Ver, uh, the third aspect of the Lord's battle you find in verse 14. Jerusalem will then plunder the nations. You see the tables are turned. It's the mirror image of what we saw in verse 1. And verse 15 simply shows how widespread this plague will be. It's going to include everything. Uh, One quick translation issue that we have in verse 14. My Bible reads, even Judah will fight against Jerusalem. Our bulletin reads, even Judah will fight at or in Jerusalem. Uh, Most of the commentators side with the NIV, the KJV, the, the New King James, the Nets, and the ASV and more and say that it should be in or at. And in fact, the ESV corrected itself later. And so this uh, in your bulletin is the modern ESV. And the picture is this. At one point, there was division in Jerusalem. And now there is no longer discord, but unity. They gather together. And rather than them being divided, they divide the spoil of the nations. The nations begin their own infighting. To quote Luther again, O comforter of priceless worth, send peace and unity on earth. Support us in our final strife and lead us out from death to life. You see, this passage provides hope for the hopeless. Hope even for families aching over wandering sons and daughters. Hope for those who feel like the evening and the gathering dark is chipping away at their minds and their bodies. Hope for those who need to hear that at evening there is not dark. There is light. Abide with me. Fast falls the even tide. The darkness deepens. Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail, other comforts comforts flee. Help of the helpless. Oh, abide with me. This chapter is for those who find that Satan's seductions and pleasures are rotting in their mouths. Has everything, perhaps even your spouse, become distasteful for you? Is everything cynical meaninglessness? 
This passage is for those starving who have forgotten the pleasure of a feast without guilt. It is for those whose eyes can no longer see the beauty of a well-laid table. It is for those who can no longer hear the trees lifting up their hands in praise at the gentle breeze. It is for those whose feet have rotted and dry rotted and cracked, who need to soak them in the healing balm of the river of life. It is for all of us who need our lives, our eyes lifted from the gathering doom to the shining city. <clears throat> Give to the wind your fears. Hope and be undismayed. God hears your sighs and counts your tears. God shall lift your head. George Grant said this when he was uh, uh, preaching in Revelation chapter 11. If it's saying here what's going to happen next, it was merely saying whatever happens next is very much like whatever happened last. So you can therefore trust God's promises to bring you through. Then we come to what I find one of the most fascinating and encouraging verses in the whole chapter, verse 16. Read that with me. Verse 16. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come up against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king. Now you would have expected that everyone who went up against Jerusalem would be wiped out. But that's not what it says. In verse 16, we find that from the plains of destruction, those who survive will go up and begin the long trek out of Egypt. Those who once railed against Jerusalem will have their hearts like John Calvin turned to docility. And they will come to the feast. For the shepherd knows his sheep, and when he calls, they will answer. They will leave the barren drought where there is no rain and there is no comfort, and they will come to the river of life. They will come up with holy to the Lord inscribed upon their hearts. They will eat and drink of the Lord's provision at His table. Do not be left in Egypt to bear the punishment of rebellion where there is no rain. Zechariah teaches us to despair, to despair of our own strength, and our own structures, and to rely upon the righteousness of Christ alone. To despair of empty meaninglessness and self-gratification and self-worship. The sheep may be scattered. In fact, they will be scattered. But the great ingathering awaits. They will come up to the Feast of Booths. In fact, it's called the Feast of Ingathering in Exodus 23. Therefore, we are charged to walk with those who wander because perhaps they are not all lost. They are as you are in the palm of the Almighty. Do you see the nations came to plunder? But God turns the tables. And one day their own ranks will be plundered. The enemy may cackle when it steals our sons. But the great enemy will look on in horror as they return. And perhaps those that are returning will plunder the nations and bring their sons and daughters with them. Were we not among their ranks? Were we not once enemies? Were we not like Paul at one point, formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor, an insolent opponent? Yes, we were once among the ranks of the nations railing against Jerusalem. So what should you do? We've walked through most of the chapter at this point. What should you do? First, if you've not begun the first lap, then hear. 
Christ came to rescue you from your sin and from your hopelessness. For through him you have access to the Father through the Spirit. Believe and live. Leave Egypt. Call your friends and your neighbors to leave Egypt. Second, when you hit that second mile and you can't catch your breath and your muscles are seizing, that longest lap, endure because you are in the palm of God's hand. Run the longest lap, but do it not on your own. Do it along the river. You cannot handle what will come apart from his church, from his word. Don't wait for the church to reach out to you to include you. You are the church. Invite folks into your home. Of course, talk about the game, but also talk about your eternal hope as well. When someone mentions they have an unexpected $1,000 bill, groan with them. Walk with them. Know the word and know each other. Next, pray and call your sons, your daughters, your friends, your children to come up to the feast with joy and with confidence, even amidst a broken and hurting world. When someone lands in a mess because of sin, go grab coffee and take the word of hope. They may rail against the Lord, but who knows when they will be led back to the river of life. You know, it's my personal guess as I wind this down. It's my personal guess that those who find uh, life unbearable, for those, the delicacies and the flavors of the eternal feast will burst forth like a river dammed up, let loose by the salvation of the Lord. Now to the holy city, the faithful gather home. To Zion's mount of glory with songs of joy they come. Who knew that Zechariah 14 was such an evangelistic message? In verses 20 and 21, we see that all things now will be dedicated to the glory of our king. And certainly here we have that principle of the already and the not yet. But what was once used for self-satisfaction is now dedicated to the glory of of the Lord. All things become sacred. Not just the priests can offer sacrifice, but the royal priesthood can come and worship. Peter says, We have obtained a faith of equal standing by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In closing, I'll say this. Because God sovereignly refines His children through fire, there is purpose in pain. For it makes peace sweet. There is purpose in suffering because it makes healing sweet. Not all tears are evil, for they prepare us for joy. The Almighty will carry you in the palm of His hand through and into the actual longest lap. It will morph and meld into the final lap of peace, that eternal lap, which began at the cross and continues along the river of the Lord where life flows on in ending, unending song. Your heartache is ever beckoning you to hope beyond the gathering storm, to travel on to the shining city. And the last verse, the last sentence of the chapter says, And there shall be no longer a traitor or a dark deceiver in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. Why? Because Christ is the light of all men. The King shall come when morning dawns and light and beauty brings. Hail Christ the Lord. The people pray, come quickly, King of kings.